Well, some of you are probably wondering why we're doing the readings of Pentecost today. I mean, it's a wonderful Sunday, and of course, Jeremy did an excellent job with the sermon. So, but I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm just not going to be afraid about that. You know, I'm just going to do my thing. And the reason I'm going to do my thing is because Pentecost is actually considered one of the most important holidays of the year. There's Christmas and Easter and Pentecost. And when I was a coming up Christian, I was told, and this is in the old days, that if you miss church, please go to these three holy days. And you will know why. We don't hear that anymore, but I think that uh, it, it says something about how times have changed. Um, it's overlooked for several reasons, and um, one was just that time has passed. And then, of course, we're competing with the secular world. We have Father's Day and Mother's Day and the Memorial Day weekend, depending on when your calendar says. Uh, at least in the United States. And then the other thing is, well, there's two other things. Um, it's not really understood. Um, well, maybe it's understood a little bit better than Trinity Sunday, but I'm not having to preach that. Um, I'm not sure that we Episcopalians are comfortable with ecstatic behavior. I think you all know what I mean, but there are churches, like Pentecostal churches, that express the Holy Spirit inside of them by showing it outside, sometimes a whole lot. And we, we just don't do that. I mean, um, most of us don't anyway. The third reason is that the story of Pentecost directly follows from the Ascension story. And here's just a tiny little bit of instruction here. As you know, ascension falls midweek, and it's often missed when we celebrate the seventh Sunday of Easter, because we really put it back on Sunday. So let's go back to the beginning of Acts of the Apostles reading. At the time of the ascension, the apostles are told by Jesus to go back to Galilee. Now, they aren't sure exactly what's supposed to be happening there. They didn't have Bishop Curry to tell them, which he has been very good to do, uh, explicit for us. Um, and they're afraid that the Roman soldiers will go after them and possibly crucify them too. So they huddle together in the upper room of this house. Now we have a better understanding of what follows. Jesus has ascended. The frightened, lonely group is waiting. Suddenly, a mighty wind, tongues of fire, people becoming ecstatic. Some say that they're drunk, speaking in many languages. And unlike the Hebrew Testament story of the Tower of Babel, everyone can understand each other. The Holy Spirit arrives, and all heaven and earth break loose. Jesus has sent them to understanding power and might. This side of the Spirit is not the softer side that comes to us generally. This is like Ezekiel's wind that revives the valley of the dry bones. This is the same fire that led the Israelites through the desert, glowing and burning. This is like thunder and lightning, which showed at Mount Sinai, as described in Exodus. This is where many of us back off. Who wants to be responsible for all of this power? Who wants that which God is now offering us. In today's gospel, 
John offers the more quiet version. He describes this softer side in light of Genesis. God breathed into their nostrils and they became living souls. The scene of the incoming of the Holy Spirit is set in the locked upper room of the house where the frightened disciples gather for their own safety in fear of the authorities who crucified Jesus. And Jesus appears and speaks, peace be with you. They recognize him as he shows them his hands and his side, where he has been nailed and where he has been pierced. This time the words, peace be with you, are like a benediction. As the Father sent me, now I send you. He's instructing them. It's as if he's saying to them and to all of us to continue what he has done in his own life. We have to keep it going. And then a strange thing happens. He breathes on them. Have, do you guys, has everybody seen the Godfather? The, the priest is baptizing and he's breathing on the baby. That's to have him receive the Holy Spirit. No big violent wind with this story, no tongues of fire, but a human breath and human words receive the Holy Spirit. Our vocations are being offered to us and we are expected to comply. These things that we renounce, these things that we affirm, they are not to be taken lightly. Do we really want to renounce the devil in our lives? Sometimes renouncing feels like a full-time job, at least it does to me. And the part about respecting the rights of every human being, <clears throat> that's hard to do sometimes all by ourselves. <clears throat> Yet, we are all God's hands and feet and eyes in the world. We have been given through the waters of baptism the same gifts of the Spirit that the disciples received. These things, as we know, are not always easy or even pleasant tasks. And then Pentecost is often overlooked. Well, again, I guess this is the fourth thing. There's this mystery thing. It's hard enough at times to accept the Christmas miracles, delightful as they are. The resurrection is difficult too, but in that miracle, that mystery offers us so much hope and joy. Pentecost opens us for us a lot of work. And again, many of us are not used to dealing with the force of God's power. It can be very scary. Alan Jones, retired Dean of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, said, Spirit is most present at three spaces in our life. The unpredictable, the place of most risk, and the area where we have the least control. And this is what we are from. This is what we are blessed with, actually. We are given the power of the Holy Spirit in love to transform our own lives as we help transform the world. Let's start by saying, in each person that we know, you don't have to worry about the whole world. But as I said the last time I preached, every little thing counts. We come to the table each week where the advocate waits to help us be renewed and ready to take us on the realities that we face when we leave this place. This is how we change the world to make it a better place. Through Christ's love, we've been given the gift of understanding and the gift of power. 